I've been asked a few times to do a video about James Roney's staters. For that matter, James Roney himself has suggested I experiment with his staters a time or two. It's been on my to-do list for a while, and it's probably a bit overdue. Real quickly before I get into that though, if you haven't already subscribed to my backup channel, you can get to it at the URL above. If anything of importance ever disappears off this platform, look for it there. If you haven't visited my other YouTube channel that features interesting topics that wouldn't fit the subject matter of this one, I invite you to do so. And for my more controversial videos, visit me at the URL above. With all of the chaos going on in the world today, it would be prudent to get yourself some storable food and provide yourself with a little peace of mind. There's a link to my favorite source of which in the description below. Also, if you aren't already a subscriber of the James Roney Staters channel, I recommend it. He does some interesting research there, and you can learn much more about his shielding techniques from him directly. I've never had any doubt that these staters work exactly the way James Roney says they do, as I've worked with shielding to some degree in past projects. Anyone who's ever worked on a computer or most electronic devices understands the importance of magnetic shielding. So it's not that large of a leap in logic to think that the proper shielding techniques could be applied to building a magnetic motor that rotates without electrical input if you're so inclined to consider such a thing possible. These are replications of James Roney's stators. As you can see, they repel each other when you place their faces in close proximity. When you turn them 180 degrees, their backsides do not repel or attract because of the shielding technique used in their construction. Just to prove that point, when you tap them with something metal, it's not attracted to them on their top or their back faces. The bottom and front faces, however, are not shielded and are attracted to the metals. To further illustrate that point, the screwdriver rolls right off the shielded area and sticks to the unshielded area. I left the faces uncovered so that you could get a better look at what's going on inside the stator, which I'll explain in more detail shortly. This first stator uses some inexpensive metal I picked up at Home Depot, as well as some mu metal inside the casing. To prove it's really doing what it appears to be doing, notice that the pole detector cannot detect the magnetic pole when placed over the top of the stator. This other version of the stator is based on the original James Roney stator design and has a metal lid from a can inside rather than the mu metal, which allows the pole detector to read a magnetic field. Though both versions function the same for the most part, the mu metal is better shielding material and it's designed for this very purpose. You can see the lid clearly when you look directly at the opening in the face. Even with the slight difference in design though, it still shields the top and back faces from the screwdriver, while it sticks to the front and bottom of the stator as it's supposed to. As many times as I've seen James Runney demonstrate this in videos, it's still pretty amazing to see it in person. I give him a lot of credit for coming up with this design. If you haven't already seen one of his videos where he explains the construction of his stators, you'll be surprised by how simple these are to build for how effectively they work. So what's inside one of these things and how do they work? To start out, the magnets are 2 inch by 1 inch by 1 quarter inch thick neodymium magnets that are magnetized through the thickness. That would be A on the diagram. Out of curiosity, I might build one that's magnetized like B in the diagram at some point though. I picked up six of these for this project from Magnets for Less for around $8.50 a piece. James recommended them for pricing in one of his videos but doesn't make a commission on their sales. He's simply pointing out one of the best places to get them without overspending. The shipping was a bit steep but they are still cheaper than another place that I checked even with the high shipping cost. The metal used for the shielding in the outer casing around the magnet, I used metal flashing material I picked up at Home Depot for under 70 cents a piece. Here's the part number if you'd like to pick some up. And here is the part number for the exact metal that James Roney uses in his stators. He's also using mu metal stripped from old VCRs on some of his stators. The makeup of the James Roney stator has changed from time to time. This is a mock-up of one of the earlier versions. 
This version uses a spacer above and below the magnet, rather than having the magnet flush with the metal. And I believe this is the version he's using for the ones that are made out of mu metal. I made one version of mine using 3D printed casings as spacers inside of three layers of magnetic shielding. They fit together like boxes stacked inside of each other. All are lined with metal shielding. These are samples of the shielding materials I used in the outer shells of each casing. I also added metal cylinders in two of the casings for extra shielding and a thick piece of mu metal between the 3D printed spacers and the other shield casing. The other five stators I set up similar to James Roney's original stator design. There's a quarter inch thick spacer made of folded cardstock paper, two completely drained dead alkaline batteries, and I used one of the spacers that came with the magnets I ordered on top of the magnets in each stator to provide a spacing between the metal shielding. The batteries are simply for additional shielding. You need to make sure they are dead if you build your own stator, so they don't explode on you by the way. There are two layers of metal shielding. This is how the parts go together with each layer. This is the stator that was the closest to James Roney's original design. For comparison, here is what the first layer of the original James Roney stator looked like. I taped everything together with clear tape so that it would be easier to keep track of each version I did, as well as to more easily demonstrate them for the video. Here is a comparison of the second layer to the second layer of the original Roni stator. These are the exact measurements of the shielding material I cut from the sheets of metal flashing I purchased from Home Depot, as well as the size of the spacers I folded from the thin cardstock. The three-layered stator is a bit larger than the others, but functions very similar, except for the fact that the magnetic field in the front face is a bit more tightly focused. Once I had the stators built, I focused on the rotor magnets and the bearing assembly. I had a few mountable magnets lying around that I picked up a while ago and decided to use those for this project. I 3D printed the mounts to make things easier to assemble and more uniform. For the bearing assembly, I decided to try something different and to mount the wheel between three strong neodymium magnets with steel balls between them to create a low friction bearing. I looked for bike wheels on Amazon and found the pricing to be a bit ridiculous. The price ranged between $30 and hundreds of dollars. So I checked Facebook Marketplace and found two full-sized adult bikes at a yard sale for $15 each. I ended up getting them both for $20 and the guy threw in a kid's bike with them so that he had less to put away later. The purpose of the shielding is to focus the spins of the magnets more tightly through one end of the stator while shielding the magnetic field on the opposite side so that it forms a ramp. The rotor is more attracted to the magnetic field in the front of the stator and less attracted to the metal on the back of the stator. The back is also angled away from the wheel to dissipate the attraction as it moves past the stator. This creates an imbalance that if applied correctly could lead to continual rotation of the wheel or rotor as this YouTuber's replication demonstrates in part. Were the backs of the magnets unshielded, the rotor would simply bounce back and forth with no motive gain, as James Roney himself has pointed out using an unshielded magnet as an example. Let me be clear that the way I set up the stator magnets and the magnets I use for my rotor are not necessarily the way James would suggest building one of these systems. He usually suggests three to four stators placed around the wheel, lined up at this angle to work best. The rotor magnets he recommends are 1 inch by 1 inch by 1 quarter inch square neodymium magnets capped with 1 inch by 1 inch by 1 quarter inch round neodymium magnets. The spacing is often sets of 6, place the distance of each bike spoke apart, but sometimes staggered slightly tighter to increase speed. I feel as though I've heard most of the arguments over the years as to why a system like this is impossible. Many dismiss the notion citing Newton's third law of motion or the first and second laws of thermodynamics. 
These are really just excuses used by lazy-minded people who want to tell you something is impossible, rather than allowing their minds to even consider what if. Regardless, a better way to explain why it's difficult to build a system like this is that there's a lattice of electrons that is not perceptible to the eye that connects the magnetic fields between the stator and rotor magnets. It dissipates as you push them further from each other, but some level of influence can be measured even over a distance. The lattice is influenced by metals and solid objects around the rotor and stator, as all materials are paramagnetic, paramagnetic, or even diamagnetic on some level. Bearing that in mind, the reason that the rotor begins to be attracted back to the stator after it's seemingly escaped its magnetic field, and the reason there's a mild to major repulsive force when approaching the stator with the rotor is because you're directly in the focal point of that lattice. This is why it's difficult to cycle magnetic motive force to achieve continual rotation in one of these systems. Picture waves of electrons bubbling out between the magnets and the rotor and stator assemblies, though the fields would look more like spirals if you could see them clearly. As you add more stators or more magnets on your rotor, these bubbles intersect each other and interfere with the system. And that's only scratching the surface. Once you get into quantum mechanics and you realize that quantum particles can know the states of other quantum particles over great distances and seemingly cease locality. But I digress. You have to take this lattice into account and configure your rotor and stator to influence this lattice in such a way that its existence doesn't hinder your results and prevent your system from functioning as intended. This clip shows a demonstration that James Roney did for me about 10 years ago. He spins the rotor into the magnetic field of the stator to show that the stator will catch the rotor and kick it back out. He also demonstrates by placing the rotor in the field of the stator approaching from the other direction that it will grab the rotor and pull it through. This demonstrates directional rotation as well as the ability for the stator to attract the rotor into its field and expel it which is the seminal thing that I look for in magnetic motive force rotational systems. I've demonstrated similar results on multiple assemblies I've built over the years, and as promising as this looks, it can be a bit deceiving. The fact that the rotor is still attracted to the stator and attempts to return to the area of greatest attraction around the stator, and the fact that there is a repulsive magnetic force as the rotor approaches the stator from the other direction shows that it has not actually escaped the electron lattice and is still caught in it. That said, it's still possible to build a rotary magnetic motor when this is the case, but the force of the expulsion from the magnetic field must be greater than the repulsive force at the entrance to each stator assembly, as well as the drag from the rotor bearing assembly inertia, etc. I'm not saying you couldn't use the shielding technique from James Roney's stators to achieve continual rotation. I'm simply trying to expound further on how this would need to be done and what you really need to look for in your design. Taking that into account should aid in designing the best system for continual rotation in a magnetic motor. This isn't actually working, by the way, so don't get excited. You can tell by the way the rotor is rocking back and forth. For the stators to be causing the rotor to accelerate enough to continually rotate while wobbling back and forth when they aren't even placed in the correct configurations would be a bit absurd, don't you think? I believe James already built a version of his motor that continually rotated for a period of time, and the video was taken down some time ago. He's since had at least one of his channels deleted, multiple videos, and has said that he's been shadow banned. Considering all that, I could see why he might be reluctant to upload a new one. I don't know the exact circumstances or the entire reason, but it's been obvious to me for some time that there's been something odd going on with his channel. I check on it periodically, and every time I do, I note that his subscriber base is always the same, even when he uploads new videos. As someone who has built YouTube channels over the last 11 years, I can tell you that that is not normal. He's obviously caught someone's attention that doesn't like what he's doing, might I politely suggest a new strategy to whomever that might be? Why not leave him be? His research is open sourced, so it's unlikely that a large investor is going to try to scoop up his research and develop it, as he's already given the information about his work away for free. A few people may stumble into some methods to utilize it for home use, and they may or may not choose to share the information with other people but it's not going to change the balance of power in the energy industry. There are a great deal of new technologies that pose an actual threat to the monopolized energy sector 
that are coming fast and hard, and many of which can't be stopped. Whereas most of us YouTube researchers are just amateurs tinkering with devices in our garages. We pose little or no threat to the powers that be in the overall scheme of things. At least that's how I see it. Anyway, these are some different configurations I experimented with. I also did some tests with the stators and the configuration that James Roney uses, but I didn't record the results. I'd like to do some tests in the future with the exact magnets on the rotor that he suggests at some point, but it is a bit expensive to purchase the amount I'd need to cover the wheel. I've always wondered what would happen if you placed the shielded stators on the rotor and aimed stators at them. The results were interesting. I'd like to see what would happen if I had more of them to fill the entire wheel. I believe that's all for now. As James Roney would say, that's all that's fit to report. Thanks for watching, and do great things.